Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Rudadoria, and this presentation is on type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Can you reverse it? So I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist. I'm a functional nutrition specialist. I'm an advisory board member for Functional Medicine University. I'm an adjunct clinical professor for the graduate nutrition program at University of Bridgeport, and I'm the founder of the Functional Medicine Alliance for the same here global international mental health nonprofit. So we have a big problem on our hands with diabetes. Just under half a billion people right now are living with diabetes. Um, that's insane. The number of people is projected to increase by 25% um, in 2030 and will be over 1 billion people in 2045. And there were only 7.6 billion people um, you know, on the planet in 2019. So a huge percentage of people have diabetes. So here's some statistics. Men more than women are affected. Those with diabetes are twice as likely to have a heart attack or stroke than those without diabetes. 11.3% um, of United States adults have physician diagnosed diabetes and 4.6% of people are walking around with undiagnosed uh, diabetes. 27 million physician office visits with diabetes as the primary diagnosis are done every single year. 102,000 Americans die every year from diabetes and has been like that for a long time. Type 2 diabetes is one of the main risk factors for severe COVID-19 illness. And if you have diabetes, the odds are that you'll die from a diabetes-related problem. The crazy thing is that this is reversible in many cases, if not most cases. So here's the progression of cardiometabolic disease. It starts out with a poor diet and lack of exercise. The standard American diet consists of very high carbohydrates, um, refined carbs more than anything else, high fructose corn syrup, uh, sweetened beverages. You know, we drink a lot of our, of our uh, carbohydrate calories. And this leads to blood sugar dysregulation, meaning that your body just can't keep your blood sugar within a certain range um, because it's just being overwhelmed. The pancreas just can't keep up with the demand. So we develop something called prediabetes. Prediabetes is, you know, a range with your hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of uh, the last three months of blood sugar between 5.7 and 6.5. So most people think they're not too bad. They're only pre-diabetic, but they develop something called insulin resistance, where insulin is no longer working in the body. And eventually that'll lead to insulin failure. And right now what's happening is because this blood sugar is high, people are gaining weight and they're gaining body fat and they're becoming obese. After a little while, systemic inflammation takes place. Inflammation is just a chronic uh, biochemical change in the way our system reacts, both our white blood cell system and a series of things called inflammatory cytokines, chemicals that induce this process called inflammation, which is extremely damaging to everything in our body. And as time goes on, we get blood vessel damage. And now all of a sudden, you, you know, the inside of the arteries are being chewed away by this very acidic uh, like, you know, blood sugar. And eventually we develop cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, people go on dialysis, um, but eventually it's called diabetes. So you have diabetes and obesity combined, and this leads to blindness, neuropathy, chronic pain, heart attack, stroke, cancer, amputations, and Alzheimer's disease. So we think, you know, what's the big deal? You know, your blood sugar is going up. Most of the time you don't feel bad. So, you know, people, that's why it's 4.6% of Americans are walking around with diabetes. They don't even know it because many times they don't really feel that much different because they're so used to not feeling great in the first place. So once you're diagnosed, um, you statistically cut off 30% of your life lifespan. 75% of the time, you will now die from cardiovascular disease, but it doesn't have to be this way. So red blood cells carry oxygen to the tissues. That's what they do. They carry oxygen from our lungs. When we, when we take a deep breath in, our heart pumps blood into our lungs. The red blood cells mix with the air in our lungs and it, it becomes magnetized to the red blood cell. And now that red blood cell can carry that oxygen and drop it off. The bloodstream is also carrying all our nutrients from the digestive system. So the red blood cells are mixing with these sugar molecules. The pancreas, which is an organ in your abdomen, uh, senses the increase in blood sugar and it releases a hormone called insulin. The insulin pulls the sugar out of the blood and it stores it inside the body cells. When sugar levels are too high for an extended period of time or insulin isn't working as well as it should, the sugar stays in the bloodstream and starts sticking to the red blood cells. The amount of sugar stuck to the red blood cells is measured by a test called hemoglobin A1C. 
And that's what that test is all about. How much sugar is stuck to your red blood cells? So if you can imagine a red blood cell is like an apple. The inside of the apple, the core with the, where the, the seeds are, or like a magnet, there's something called hemoglobin inside that red blood cell. That hemoglobin acts as a magnet. It magnetizes oxygen and the oxygen sticks to the red blood cell. And it carries it and drops it off to where it needs to go, in your brain, your heart, everywhere else. But as time goes on, when you have elevated blood sugar, you start developing a candy coating around the apple, around the red blood cell. And as that coating becomes thicker and thicker, it reduces the amount of magnetism that that apple can really have and it no longer has that, that magnetic attraction for oxygen. And basically what's happening is you're, you're, you're starving your oxygens, uh, starving your tissues of, of oxygen and they start to die off. So the standard of care in managing hemoglobin A1C. The goal, you know, traditionally is to get you out of the danger zone and, you know, keep you in as low, um, you know, as low level as you can be. But unfortunately, you know, the medications that people take lower their hemoglobin uh, A1C, but it never really gets them out of the woods. So, and that's because most people just don't change their diet. They continue to eat a lot of carbohydrates. In fact, I've had patients that told me that their doctor said, you know, just keep, you know, taking the insulin. And, and if you have soda, if you have cake, if you have candy, just take an extra shot. And what that, what that does is it's enabling people to feel like, oh, as long as I take this insulin, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have an effect. I'll be fine. And that's just not the case. So here's, here's a big deal. Um, hemoglobin A1C and dementia. Uh, we know that uh, type three diabetes is now called Alzheimer's disease. So we know that there's a direct link between elevated blood sugar long-term and dementia. So you can see these A1C numbers, like 4.4 to 5.2, you have a certain amount of brain shrinkage, but a very tiny amount because our brains shrink with age. But as soon as you hit 5.3 to 5.5, look at that significant increase. And then once you hit, you know, in the 5.9, you're still pre-diabetic, you know, in that 5.9 range, but it's almost double the amount of brain shrinkage yearly because your blood sugar is so high. So it's not just about blood sugar, it's about brain health. So we get this false sense of security with medication. So there was a study done that says glycemic targets, uh, standards of medical care and diabetes. And what they realized was that no significant impact of tight glycemic control, meaning medication reducing A1C levels, which um, that would actually change the rate of risk of dialysis, transplants, renal death, blind, blindness, and neuropathy. So it's not just the blood sugar. It's what is the blood sugar doing to the rest of your system? And we need, to, we need a much better approach. And that better approach really is lifestyle change. So here's the blame game. In 1990, um, there was a 12% um, in the United States, 12% of people were obese. That's not that long ago, 12%. And everybody blamed fats. So everybody went on a low fat diet. And as a result, the, you know, the food uh, industry, in order to make things taste good, because they took the fats out, they significantly increased the amount of sugar that they put into the foods. So everybody was eating low fat and they were eating, you know, much, much higher sugar. Then in 2005, it doubled. So in 15 years, the obesity rate doubled in the United States. And then all of a sudden it was carbohydrates. Carbs are bad. 2019, it bumped up another 4%. Now sugar's to blame. But the reality is it's not just sugar. It's lifestyle. It's exercise. It's sunlight. It's, it's mindset. It's all of these different things because it takes, it takes a significant lifestyle shift in order to reverse this. So what is food? Food, when you eat a meal that's, you know, you go out to eat, you go out to dinner, and you know, it's, it's really made up of three main macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. But people, unfortunately, are in an abusive relationship with food, and they know it. So if they were in an abusive relationship with a friend or a spouse, they would do everything they could to probably get out of that relationship. But people are in an abusive relationship with food, and yet they keep going back. They know that the food is doing bad things to them. They know that they're gaining weight. They know that they feel lethargic. They know that they have high blood sugar. They know that their um, inflammation levels are high. Yet, they keep going back to food. Because in America, food is fun. Food is social. We eat when we're happy. We eat when we're sad. We eat when we're celebrating. We eat all the time. Not a good thing. So 
These are the three main food groups. So carbohydrates are really sugars and fiber. Sugars become energy and body fat. That's the only thing that sugar can do in your body. Once you, once you eat it and digest it, it either becomes energy immediately or it becomes body fat. When you digest proteins, they become amino acids. And amino acids can become energy and body fat as well, but they become all of your brain chemicals. All of your neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and so on, are made directly from amino acids. And they're literally the building blocks of your entire body. Every single thing about you comes from amino acids. So your skin, your nails, your hair, your muscles, your teeth, everything is made from protein. And then we have fats. Fatty acids can become energy and body fat as well, but fats become all of your hormones and your whole brain. So when we think about the three main food groups, the only thing that carbs can do is create energy and body fat. Obviously, we need the fiber. It's a whole different story. I'm just talking about the sugar part of the carbohydrates. But we can get energy and body fat from both of these sources, but we get so much more. So it really shows you, percentage-wise, how much carbohydrate do we really need to eat? So here are a whole series of things on the right-hand side. And high blood sugar, blood sugar is, a, is a big part of it. But poor diet gastrointestinal issues, high blood sugar, low sunlight exposure, no exercise, poor nutrient status, infections, toxins, chronic stress. Chronic stress comes from trauma, um, you know, work-related stress, family stress, a high ACE score. ACE score is called adverse childhood events, things that happen to us when we're kids. Um, something called MTHFR, which is a, a genetic SNP that causes our detoxification system to not work as well as it should. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction or fat metabolism. PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome that causes um, you know, hormone imbalances and low testosterone. All of these things cause this process of inflammation to develop, and that leads to diabetes. So it's not just blood sugar. It's a whole series of things that need to be evaluated in order to reverse this. So the variables are, you know, what is your food intake? What's your basal, basal metabolic rate? How many calories do you actually need? And how do you, how do you break up those calories? How are you digesting? So it's not just what you eat, it's what you absorb. Um, food timing, you know, something called intermittent fasting. Are you eating from the minute you wake up until the minute you go to sleep? Because we know that the longer the fasting period that you create, the more metabolically healthy your body will be. So for instance, um, people will eat uh, within an eight hour window. So they might eat all of their calories for the day between, uh, you know, let's say 11 a.m. and 7 p.m., and they don't eat anything before, anything after. And what they see is a significant shift in their, in their metabolic rate. Um, the quality of the food that you're eating. Leptin. Uh, Leptin is a hormone that's released by your body fat cells. And that's directly related to circadian biology, which controls everything about our body, our day-night cycles. Sleep, obviously, is a big deal. This insulin resistance. The microbiome. The microbiome is, the, is this colony of bacteria, this trillions and trillions of bacterial cells that live in our gut that we just found out about in 2008 that play a huge role in our overall metabolic rate, our, our mental capacity, um, our mood, our immune system, our digestion, our vitamin production, all of these different things come from the microbiome and the, and the gastrointestinal system, our hormones, our mindset, and overall inflammatory levels. So the two biggies really are the microbiome and the mindset. What we see is with people that have diabetes, we see a very, a very clear change in the, in the bacterial colony that lives in their gut. They become sensitized to carbohydrates and it, that shifts their meta people's metabolism. Uh, the mindset also is, you know, what I was saying before about your relationship with food, um, you know, what you believe food to be, uh, how much food do you think you need? Most people believe that they need to eat a lot more than they do. And, um, you know, again, food can, you know, food is very um, social and we feel like, you know, it's hard for us to socialize. You know, I have people that tell me, you know, food is, is love, you know, food is how I show love with, with my family and, and all these different things. So, you know, we need to really look at and, and discuss like what is food to people and, and, you know, what makes it so important. And, you know, if you have a cat or a dog, you know that they eat the same thing every single day. They don't need 49 different varieties of, of um, you know, of food uh, in order to be happy. You can essentially feed them, you know, to, you know, the same dog food their whole life and, and they'll be very happy because they're eating to live. They're not eating because of social behavior or, or food addiction. 
So the microbiome, again, is this collection of microbes that live in the gut. And, you know, this particular um, journal article was in the World Journal of Diabetes. And it says, we paint a clear picture of how strongly microbes are linked and associated with the fundamental and essential parts of diabetes in humans. The microflora, these bacteria, seem to have an endless capacity to impact and transform diabetes. There's a clear and growing evidence of close relationship between the microbiota and diabetes. So if we don't fix your gut, you probably will be uh, diabetic for the rest of your life. So again, it's not just about cutting sugar. It's about looking at your body as a whole. So getting healthy and staying healthy is a lifestyle. So here's, you know, here's, this is an example of a stool test. So we're able to map the healthy bacteria, the normal bacterial flora in people's bodies. So you can see we have a digestive issue at the top. This is called pancreatic elastase. And we can measure this. I mean, it's supposed to be, you know, the lowest it's supposed to be is 200. And it's supposed to really be significantly higher than that to make sure that you're digesting protein. And yet this patient has very, very low pancreatic elastase. And then when we look at their bacterial colony, we see that they're very, very low in four of the main probiotics, and they're actually missing one. So not a good thing. You know, this is abnormal. But then when we look at the additional with dysbiotic unhealthy bacteria, they have six elevations. And over here, they have two that are actually triggering, potentially triggering autoimmunity in their body. And then we look at fungi down at the bottom, like candida, and we have that as well. So these are all different examples of an abnormal, unhealthy microbiome. And we see this commonly with people with diabetes. So the mindset, you must replace misconceptions, misguided beliefs, and bad habits. So, you know, I can eat what I want and my medication protects me. It's just not true. I have to eat six small meals per day. No. High fat foods are unhealthy. Nope. I can lose 30 pounds in 30 days. Not a good, not a good plan. Um, as long as it's gluten-free, it's good. Probably not because gluten-free foods are significantly higher in other um, refined carbohydrates. So uh, all carbs are bad, which isn't true. Keto is the best diet, not necessarily. Uh, I have to eat before, I, before bed to sleep. Um, I have to finish everything on my plate. I eat when I'm happy, sad, frustrated, or stressed. These are all things that people you know, believe. And as long as you have these, um, you know, these, these beliefs that really don't work for you, it's going to be very difficult for you to reverse diabetes. So you got to free your mind and the rest will follow. So how can we beat diabetes? First of all, we need to identify where you are physically through extensive functional lab work. We need to know what your gut looks like. We need to know what all these metrics are that we've discussed. We need to get your mind right. We need to look at and, and talk about what's on your mind. You know, how stressed are you right now? How are you managing your stress? We need to realign this microbiome. We need to get rid of the bad bacteria and introduce healthy bacteria. Um, we need to get significantly increased numbers of um, quantities of fiber in your diet. And then we have to create a plan of lifestyle modification that includes exercise, mindset, meditation, and all these different things. And then life coaching to help make these changes permanent. So if you go through a three to six month shift in thinking, you can literally reverse your diabetes. And it might take a year, depending on how long you've had it, depends on how, you know, how deep in the, in the woods you are, um, how much damage you've done and all these different kinds of things. But we can, we, we've seen amazing, amazing things happen when people put these types of plans in place. So, you know, again, I'm Dr. Michael Grudadoria, and um, I'm glad that you took the time to listen to this presentation.